first question I have to ask is, did you all brush your teeth after lunch? <laughs> no excuses, really. Um, thank you very much for the opportunity to come and speak, um, and perhaps to share a wee bit of my experiences of treating complex children, not necessarily children with Castillo, though, because I, I only know one, and she's sat, well, mum sat there, um, and, and CFC. So, <coughs> Thank you for the, for the invitation and also for the invitation from a, a, a personal perspective to learn a bit more about this, these fascinating conditions. Um, because really, oral health is part of general health. And the most important thing to understand is what you guys do at home has much more impact than anything else I could ever do in a dental surgery. So I'm going to share some um, fairly basic oral health messages and try and tailor them a little bit to my understanding of the, the issues that you face and I, I hope you'll correct me if I'm wrong. We've heard a lot about features of Castello and CFC today so I'm not going to dwell too much but um, I did manage to find a little bit of literature about the facial and, and oral features because there isn't really an awful lot of information out there. Um, so I thought it would be useful just to, you've probably seen this, but just to sort of reiterate. Um, these were the findings that were actually um, presented in the CFC newsletter. Um, and it was, uh, they were based on the, the conference that took place in uh, Berkeley in California in 2009. And there were 25 CFC families who were, were examined by a whole multitude of professionals, including a dentist. I think that was possibly the first time that happened. Um, so they confirmed the, the um, facial features and then they went on to describe uh, in a little bit more detail about what the, the typical oral features might be. Um, um, and one of, the, one of the important ones, I guess, and one of the, the common ones that you, you'll recognise is, is the presence of a malocclusion and that's just basically about how your teeth fit together, how your jaw, what your jaw pattern is. Um, and they found that, you'll hear people talk about an anterior open bite, which is basically when you put your back teeth together, you still have a gap in between the front ones. And they found that was prevalent in about 40% of, of, of kids. They talked about tongue thrust. Now, tongue thrust is a bit of a chicken and egg, a chicken and egg scenario because if you have a tongue thrust, quite often it goes hand in hand with an anterior open bite. And you've got to ask yourself, well, if the tongue's coming in between the teeth when the teeth are erupting, is it the tongue that's contributing to that anterior open bite? Or is the tongue naturally finding a nice space at the front to rest in because the anterior open bite is there and it's a skeletal thing? We don't know is the answer, but it's just, you know, it's interesting to sort of think about these things. That's how it all sort of starts to interlink. Lip apart posture is where you basically um, do a lot of breathing through your mouth so your lips aren't together at rest. And that again goes hand in hand with sometimes with a tongue thrust and with an anterior open bite. And kids who have a very constricted upper nasal airway tend to breathe through their mouths. A high and narrow palate was a really common feature. What's the significance of that from a, from a, from a, an oral health point of view? Well, not a lot to be perfectly honest. But if you think about the anatomy of your top jaw. Your top jaw is naturally horseshoe shaped and you've got a lot of teeth to fit into a horseshoe shape. So if you have a very narrow jaw, then potentially you could have less room to fit in all your teeth. So dental crowding might be a, might be a problem in, in, uh, you know, later on. One of the things that was of interest to me really about the findings from this study was um, they commented that tooth shape, size and number were completely normal. They didn't find any um, abnormalities about to the shape, size and number. Now that's interesting to me when we start to think about um, the facial features, the skin features, the nails and the hair features are all um, derived from a, a tissue called the ectoderm, <coughs> well, so are teeth. So if, if you take a kind of logical way through that you would think well maybe there are tooth abnormalities as well but apparently not. There are some studies ongoing looking at enamel, which is the, the outer coating of the, of the tooth, the hard, the hard bit of the tooth, um, and uh, I'll await the results of that eagerly and hopefully be able to share them with you at some point. Okay. 
So let's talk a little bit about the other features of Costello and CFC that might impact on um, oral health. There are really sort of two ways to look at it. If oral health is part of general health and you have a child with um, complex medical disorder, well some of those conditions might be actually causing oral health issues that we need to deal with. Similarly, um, dealing with the issues might impact on the, the medical aspects of care. So sometimes we have to rethink how we do things because we have to take into account the medical bits and bobs. So I just picked out some of the ones really that, that I have to, the things that keep me awake at night, the things that I have to consider when I, when I meet your, your kids uh, in, the, in my dental surgery. Um, cardiac defects you've already heard about, um, especially cardiac defects that you're born with. Um, years ago, dentists used to have to routinely prescribe antibiotics if you were planning to take a tooth out or cause anything that was any kind of bleeding within the, the, the oral cavity. That's changed a bit and I'm going to talk about that in a few seconds. We heard a lot this morning from uh, Rebecca about feeding and GI problems and the whole reflux, vomiting, oral aversion, hypersensitivity, gagging issue is very, you know, something we really have to think about as dentists because it is an in-your-face profession. You, know, you, can, you have to actually get into the oral cavity to, to do stuff, you know, so there, there's a little bit of crossover here, isn't there, with the oral hypersensitivity and, and getting dental treatment done, maybe even toothbrushing, and some of you might be able to share that experience. Um, what does it mean when, you, when a child has learning difficulty and developmental delay? What does that mean for their oral health? Well, um, more often than not, it's about compliance. So actually getting your child to comply with what you want them to do and understanding why it's necessary to toothbrush, you know, and just getting them into a routine. And the same in, 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 uh, in the dental surgery as well. Well, why, do, why should I sit in that chair? You know, why should I open my mouth? Why should I let you in there with that big buzzy thing? Okay, so we have to think about that. Sometimes we need to go down the route of maybe a little bit of sedation just to help relax and get rid of the anxiety. And that's the kids, not the parents, although sometimes the parents could do with that too, I should say. Um, you know, so we have to consider that. Low muscle tone also has a bit of an implication for oral health in terms of um, grip. Toothbrushing requires actually quite a lot of coordination and a good, a good grip on a toothbrush. Okay, so sometimes that's the reason why the toothbrushing maybe isn't as good as it could be. And we have, you've got to take that into account as well. Um, seizures, epilepsy, epilepsy, some medications, phenytoin is the main culprit, can cause effects on the gums. They can make the gums overgrow, so we have to take that into account as well. Um, and then Physical, the physical impact of a child having scoliosis or kyphosis means that they may not be able to physically lie in your dental chair. So you may have to put some padding around them to keep them comfortable when you recline them. Perhaps you can't recline them all the way. Okay? So you have to rethink how you do things sometimes. I talked a wee bit, I mentioned a little bit about heart problems. Um, it is now completely okay, I hope Nalima doesn't mind me saying this, but it is now completely okay to do dental treatment if you have a cardiac defect. You don't need antibiotic prophylaxis anymore. The reason was um, that there was a theoretical risk of um, developing infective endocarditis, and I'm sure you've heard that bandied around. Okay. New guidance was published in 2007 that states that that's not necessary now for dental procedures and I think ENT procedures were the same. Okay. Some of your cardiologists may disagree with that. The way that I manage that in the children's hospital is if we, if we disagree, we either agree to disagree. If my cardiologist insists that we, we give antibiotics, I make them do it. <laughs> so that's a good thing, isn't it? That, you know, we're not giving antibiotics unless it's absolutely necessary, that's great as far as I'm concerned. Working in a children's hospital environment, I use a lot of sedation and general anaesthesia. Um, more often than not, the, the complex kids will, will have to be in a specialist children's hospital environment so that they're managed appropriately by the, um, the consultant paediatric anaesthetist with all the experience in managing complex kids. That's something that they 
the lemma mentioned about arrhythmias. Sometimes I have to I have to think about that because some of the equipment I use, um, I maybe can't use it. For example, a, a, a particular type of dental electronic scaler. If a kid has a pacemaker, I can't use that. I have to I have to think my way around that problem and do it differently. Um, some medications have effects on gums that we need to be aware of as well. Calcium channel blockers, they cause gum overgrowth as well. I don't know how common it is to use those in, in children, but sometimes you see it. And it's something you need to take into account. I need to take into account. I'm just going to spend a bit of time talking about oral health problems in, in, uh, in particular. So the three main, main suspects really are um, decay, uh, erosion or tooth wear, um, and malocclusion. I've, I've touched on that. I'm not, I'm not an orthodontist, so I'm not going to waste time talking about braces and stuff. Just to give you a little bit of background information, dental disease is the most common reason why children receive a general anaesthetic in the UK. And this is all children across the board. That's a really shocking figure at the bottom, isn't it? More than 40% of all five-year-olds in the UK have experienced some kind of dental decay by, by the time they reach age five. If you add a medical complication into that mix, you've really got a big cocktail disaster pending. So this is why um, I really want to impress upon you how important it is, uh, what the importance <laughs> is of you, you doing stuff at home. You know, it really does make a difference. It really, really does make a difference. We've got tooth problems. We've got gum problems. Um, in Castello, my one, my experience of my one patient, sometimes um, gums have a kind of red or granular appearance. I don't really know why. We've been brushing like mad, haven't we? Trying to sort things out. I don't know why. That's, it may be part of the syndrome. It may just be. It may just be. Um, part of medication effects, I don't know. Okay. Gingivitis is just simply the early stages of gum disease that's limited to the, the neck, the, gin, the gingivae, the gums around the necks of the tooth. That's where the plaque will grow and develop okay. and that's where the inflammation is and that is completely preventable and completely curable just by brushing, just by brushing efficiently and often enough. Sometimes you see unusual lesions as well, um, and Kath might recognise this photo. <laughs> um, this little blister on the gum is something that Helena presented with, and we, we were completely baffled. We didn't know what it was really. Um, so I organised a quick consultation with one of my colleagues up at the dental hospital, and um, he stood and scratched his head, and he proclaimed that he didn't know what it was either, so I felt quite good, thank goodness for that, I wasn't the only one. Um, it turned out to be a little mucus cyst, just a little collection, like a little bubble of mucus, just growing just underneath the gum tissue. Quite an unusual sight for it, underneath the gum, but you know, you're on the lookout, when you've got complicated kids, you're on the lookout for unusual things as well. Common things will occur commonly, but you'll also get little unusual things as well. So how can you ensure that you do everything you possibly can to make sure you get that good oral health for your child? Well, tooth brushing, easy for me to say. Diet and sugar restriction, I know they're feeding, feeding issues, feeding difficulties. Um, Sugar-free medicines, and that's something you definitely can do. Okay? Lobby your, your specialists for sugar-free medicines, because there are an awful lot of sugar-free preparations out there now. Um, fluoride. Fluoride is the, the kind of um, the silent protector. Fluoride is in your toothpaste. In some parts of the UK, too few in, in my opinion, the water supply is fluoridated. In the majority of the UK it's not. Your dentist will be able to advise you whether that's, that's the case or not. But fluoride is the, the one thing that really helps to prevent dental decay. And it goes without saying, regular dental visits. Now that can be your own family dentist, that can be a contact with your local community dental services, or it can be contact with hospital dental services, as long as it's regular. 
These are the Bibles that we use, uh, two publications, um, one published by the Department of Health, which is the Delivering Better Oral Health. This is our prevention toolkit. This is where all our oral health messages um, are, are uh, evidence-based, and this is where they all, they're all published, they're all written up. Um, and the other one is Prevention and Management of Dental Case um, in Children, and this is a Scottish dental publication um, published by the Clinical Effectiveness Programme. But they both carry similar, similar messages. So I've just picked out some, some bits to talk about really. At the end of the day, I could stand and give you um, a big spiel about what you should and shouldn't do in terms of um, oral health management. It won't be particularly useful to you if it's not relevant to your child. Okay. So all I can hope to achieve today really is to give you, give you basic foundations, but then um, the onus is on you to discuss in more detail your child with your, your trusted family dentist or your community dentist. Because really, for the advice to be effective for you, it's got to be tailored to your individual child. So we'll talk a little bit about toothbrushing messages. Is everyone able to manage toothbrushing? No. Real problem. Real problem. The oral hypersensitivity thing. The aversion thing. Okay. Okay. Morning and bedtime. Definitely. We heard this morning when when Rebecca was talking about feeding issues, about how it can be overcome with little little steps forward and a couple of steps back, it's the same with toothbrushing. It's exactly the same. And establishing habits earlier on in life is going to be so much easier than trying to break habits or introduce new behaviours later on. Okay, so the same principles kind of apply to toothbrushing. And I know you're sitting there going, well. <coughs> I've got a child, I can't get anything in them, I can't even get a spoon in the mouth, we're not doing anything orally, why do I need to brush the teeth? But it's important to, re to remove the plaque, even if your child isn't having anything orally, the plaque will continue to grow there, it will continue to build up on the teeth. And although your child may be predominantly um, gastros to be fed, you may still be giving them tasters, is that right? Yeah, tasters of sweet things. Potentially, tastes of anything, everything, everything, everything. So those tastes will stay on the teeth. They will. So those kind of, that's when you know you have to get get the brushing going along with that as well. Good idea to try and start the habit even before the teeth appear, even before they appear, um, and use a high fluoride toothpaste. Now, an adult toothpaste is fine in really little, really little kids and your dentist can advise you about when you can switch to an even higher toothpaste for Helena. I use, I prescribe a, a, a treatment toothpaste which has got double the amount of fluoride that a, a normal adult toothpaste has. It gives her an, an extra bit of prevention really without even trying <coughs> because I'm not asking her to change anything, just her toothpaste. How much toothpaste? You only need a tiny bit, a tiny, a tiny taste, a taster toothpaste almost, a smear on the brush, that's it. doesn't need to be a big ribbon on the adverts, you see them labelling out two inches of toothpaste, that's just to get you to use it more quickly and buy more. Okay, you only need a tiny, tiny bit. Um, it goes without saying that parents need to help, you need to help, because some of your children won't have that coordination to be able to put that toothbrush where it needs to go to do its job effectively, and it's actually the brush that, that, that makes the difference. It's contact with the bristles actually on the gums and the teeth that, that makes a difference. Even a dry brush or a wet brush with no paste on it would remove the plaque. Okay. Spitting out the extra toothpaste, excess toothpaste, not rinsing the mouth. Fluoride toothpaste stays on the, on the teeth as long as you possibly can. That's the best thing you can do. Okay. And there are all sorts of special brushes out there. Like this one, Dr. Barman's brush. This is a three-headed brush. Has anybody seen it? Have you, have you seen anything like this before? I give these out quite a lot. I use them quite a lot, and I find parents find them really, really, really useful. Because if you do manage to get a toothbrush in there, 
onto the tea. It's going to brush three bits of the tooth all at one, all in one go. Okay. Um, I teach parents how to how to trick kids. I shouldn't say this really. How to trick kids into having their teeth brushed. Um, lots of distraction, lots of little games, things like that, and little tips. How to position yourself so that your child doesn't see you coming at them with a you know, with a great big toothbrush. Uh, and, and that does increase compliance, it does, it really works. Um, have any of you ever, do you, do you suffer from the problem of your kids will clamp their teeth down and then games of bogey, that's it, it's all over? When, I, when parents tell me that the, the child does that, then I usually give them two toothbrushes. I'll give them the three-headed one and then I give them a normal toothbrush with a big fat handle and I'll tell them to turn it around. And if you can get a little bit of that big fat handle in one side, if they clamp down, fine, all they're going to do is bite on the squishy <laughs> handle. You've got a gap. That's when an IT will be bites, but you saw that when you think about it. Um, you've got a gap on the other side, you can get that toothbrush in. And you might, you know, you might only get one side of the, the teeth brushed in the morning. But you can do the other side in the evening. Okay, so think, you know, tips and tricks. Egg timers, we use those quite a lot. Um, just as a, a bit of a motivational thing, but also, you know, you should, the, the, the old health message is brush for two minutes. You know, who's, who times themselves, let's face it. I've got the um, Sonic That's got a timer on it. That's got a, That's got a timer on it. Yeah, it is very good. And the vibration yeah. is probably quite soothing. Yes. yes. It is worth, it's worth it. It does, yeah. Yeah, absolutely. Um, these are just some little oral hygiene adjuncts that you can use. Corsidol gel, you may have heard about. It's a chlorhexidine gel. It's an, it's an antibacterial gel. Um, it's antiseptic, really. Um, you get it in mouthwash form, and you get, you get it in a gel. You can use that if you, if you, you find that your child has um, particularly bad gingivitis or particularly uncomfortable gums, but only for a short time, because it stops working if you use it continuously. Okay, so you've got to, it's alright to use a little bit every now and again, right, and it is quite a helpful thing. Disclosing tablets are little vegetable dye tablets that can be crunched up. I wouldn't recommend them for little tiny kids, but these are for, these are for your older kids. Crunched up, licked all around the teeth, swish with water, look in the mirror, oh my goodness. All that plaque in glorious purple. <laughs> And it's fantastic because at least you can see what it is, the kids can see what it is, and it's fun. The bathroom will be covered in it, you know, but if the teeth are clean, I'm happy. Uh -huh. okay. Diet advice. I'm a bit scared to show you this, actually. <laughs> um, okay, basic, basic health, me oral health messages. Water and milk, nothing else to drink. Um, fizzy drinks. Do you find your kids drink fizzy drinks? No. Not particularly. Yay. Excellent. Good. Because fizzy drinks tend to cause erosion. And reflux can cause erosion as well. And what erosion is, is basically acid damage. And you lose the enamel on your, on your teeth, particularly the backs of the front teeth, but also the, the um, biting surfaces of the back teeth as well. Okay. So if your child has reflux, and reflux is a problem, then their teeth are going to be at risk. So you don't want to add extra risk in terms of lots of acid things in the diet, fizzy drinks. I'm, I'm glad to hear about that. What your dentist will find really useful in order to tailor the advice for your child is a, is a diet diary. If you keep a diet record for them, I'm not suggesting you do it for like three months. Three days is all you need. Okay. I find that incredibly useful in my line of work because it just gives me much more insight into family eating habits, the child's eating habits, bedtime, um, and how often kids eat, and what they eat. Can I just add what you just said about the reflux? Yeah. I know you heard earlier what I said about my son who's nine. Mm -hmm. Last year we had 17 <coughs> and the dentist at the time, when I saw her, and she said, what have you done to your child? What are you feeding him? Mm -hmm. And I told her that this thing he had, she said, well, then none of them were fed. And I said about the reflux, and she said, no, that wouldn't cause it. Oh, it does. Yes, it does. He said to take the three out. He came out of the child with 17 weeks, and plus the three that he'd already lost naturally. Yeah. 
If the reflux is under control, yeah. well, less risk, you've still got the risk. You've still got the risk. I often see, I see kids with um, erosion, it's the first thing in my head. You know, what's going on systemically? Is there anything I need to be aware of? Because acid can come from two, two sources, can't it? It's either coming up from the inside or it's going in from the outside. Mm -hmm. you know, and and you, sometimes it's a combination of both. The bit you can control is the bit that comes in from the outside. The bit you can't manage as well without you know, drugs and stuff is the bit that comes up from the inside. But it's all about um, damage limitation. You heard that phrase earlier on. Okay, not making matters worse, because that is a known risk for kids with CFC and um, Castella in particular. How can you, how can you sort of, is that just again, brushing, because he gets confident still? I'm going to talk a wee bit about, I've got some specific advice about erosion because it is slight, it's a slightly different way of thinking about it. Actually brushing straight after vomiting, for example, is, a, is something you shouldn't do because it can take more than a month. Oh, yeah. I'll talk about that in a wee bit yeah. tick. Talked a little bit about fluoride. Fluoride's a new toothpaste. Um, if you're lucky enough to live in a, a part of the country like around Birmingham or um, around Newcastle, then there may be uh, some fluoride in the water supply, but by and large, there isn't really anywhere else. Okay. So you rely on your fluoride from a, an, an extrinsic source, if you like, you, it, from a toothpaste or something you're going to physically apply to the teeth, either you or the dentist is going to physically apply to the teeth. So toothpaste is the obvious one, okay, but there are also other vehicles. If your child can manage to, to do a mouthwash, then that can be quite fun. Okay, but the, the, the key with the fluoride mouthwash is to do it at a time that's different from when you're brushing the teeth, because you want that extra contact of fluoride on the teeth. So no, no rinsing with the mouthwash directly after brushing or just before. Do it at a time that's separate, then you get more benefit that way. Okay. And fluoride also helps to prevent or lessen the damage from erosion as well. Um, there are tab fluoride is available in a tablet form and a drop. To be perfectly honest, I don't find them particularly useful. And I know I know that mums have said, "Well, you know, we did it for a month and then we ran out, and then that we didn't bother renewing the prescription." And he doesn't like tablets anyway, and I can't get them into him. So fine, great. Let's find a different way to get fluoride onto those teeth. Um, your dentist can do uh, can put fluoride varnish onto the teeth professionally. And that, if that's done four times a year, that's great. That's great. And it's something that's just painted on, literally with a little tiny paintbrush, in and out. You can do it in seconds. You don't even need that much compliance. Okay. You just need to be quick. Okay. That's just some typical um, samples from a range of companies. Not to show that, just a all about Aquafresh. Uh, I just wanted to show you this slide. This is where to look on the toothpaste to find out how much fluoride is actually in your toothpaste. Because not all toothpastes are the same. But most adult toothpastes have 1400 or 1450 parts per million fluoride, PPM capital F. That's the figure you look for. Okay. You want something between 1000 and 1450 or, or thereabouts. So, do you say that even for small children in our situations, we should be using adult toothpaste? You should be using toothpaste that's around about a thousand up to about age two. And, okay, and the, so the, the normal toothpaste that's marketed at little, little ones yeah. is a lot lower than that, is it? It used to be, it's actually changed a lot. Oh. They, used, they used to, um, the, little, the little teeth, this one, yeah. um, milk teeth and, yeah. and similar yeah. ones, used to have between 500 and 600 parts per million fluoride half yeah. what you what is recommended now. Okay. Across the board, what's recommended is at least a thousand. Okay. okay. But those um, milk teeth ones now are appropriate. They all now have, yeah. in fact, this one has fourteen hundred. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. How about the tooth mousse that you can just wrap on Yeah. It's that's fifteen pounds, but it's quite good. Have you got tooth mousse have you got the one that's got fluoride in it as well? Mm -hmm. Because that's the new, that's the newer one. That's a that's a cheese protein that's based on. It's really innovative stuff, and it sticks onto the teeth, and it's very good yeah. to help combat erosion. I didn't put a slide in about that. Actually, thank you for the reminder. Can I just ask about mouth? Um, yeah. Or anything? Can they swallow anything? Or, yeah. 
We, no we normally recommend that you, kids over the age of six should be able to spit out. That's the key bit. Forget the age. Can can your child spit out? You know. Spit out. If he's able to take a gulp and spit out, that's your key. Then you need to do it. Yeah. Otherwise. Um, fish, this is something the dentist can do uh, with a compliant patient um, and that just involves basically sealing up the, the little nooks and crannies, the little crevices on the molar teeth in particular. Okay, It does take a bit of compliance but you can um, introduce the concept, uh, use tell show do techniques and actually um, get it done. You know, you might have to do it in little steps and you might only get one tooth done one day and the next time it'll be another tooth and again, little tiny steps. Acclimatisation really is what that's all about. But that's something your dentist can do. Okay. Once it's done, it's just like nail varnish for teeth effectively. Okay. But it does need to be maintained, it does need to be topped up every now and again for it to remain effective. Erosion, here we go. All right. Water and milk is best again. Um, fizzy drinks, the reason I'm saying don't do fizzy is because fizzy drinks are very acidic. Diet drinks in particular. You win on the, not, the no sugar bit, but you lose on the lots of acid bit. Okay. Um, something with calcium in it is, is a good thing to have after you have a, a, something acidic to eat or drink. So a bit of cheese or a glug of milk is very, very good because what happens when you have um, something acidic is um, the pH of your saliva goes plummets right down, becomes very, very acidic. And it does take at least 30 minutes to 40 minutes for that to come back up to normal with your own saliva buffering it, if you like. Okay. Um, if you put something in there that will change the balance of things, it will bring the pH back up to neutral much faster. One of, the one of the key messages about sugar intake is, is it's not so much how much sugar, it's how often it's frequency. Because every time you eat or drink something, you have an acid attack. And your saliva will, um, the pH of your saliva will, will plummet. And then your natural resources will bring it back up to neutral over the course of 40 minutes, like we've just said. Um, if you have your breakfast and then an hour later, your pH plummets again because you're having a snack, and then maybe an hour later it plummets again because you're having a snack. What actually happens is it never ever goes back to neutral. You get this sort of yo-yo effect and then it plateaus and it stays at a much more, a lower level, an acidic level. And that's when the balance can be tipped and that's when you get decay starting or erosion even as well. So um, that's why dentists bang on about just have sugar with meal times, that's okay. Because you're having an acid attack anyway. But in between snacky things, try to avoid the sugary ones, stick to savoury. Using a straw is really, really helpful. To come back to erosion, using a straw is really, really useful if your child can suck. I know that's an issue, but some, but some, some kids can. Some kids can manage it. Okay. The advantage is the liquid then goes shooting down the back of the throat and avoids the teeth completely. Juices. 50-50 with water. Even the nice healthy ones, fresh apple juice, fresh orange juice, very, very acidic. Apple juice in particular, very high in acid, very, very high in acid. Um, so 50-50 with water if you can. All right. Again, it's all about damage limitation. You don't want to add to an already compromised uh, enamel surface. Can I ask you that, sorry? Go ahead. When you brush your teeth, yeah. is it true? But you know how some people put their toothbrush under the water and do that at the end? To so not do that because you're basically rinsing off. You're diluting it really, aren't you? It's the same, same principle behind spitting out the extra toothpaste and not rinsing. Yeah. Don't rinse too much. Don't rinse it. Yeah. No, rinse it, but don't put it back in your mouth. Yeah. 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 Exactly the same. Because you are effectively diluting it, aren't you? You're taking it back off. Yeah, and the, the, it's going to have most benefit if it stays on you for longer. Last thing, a little bit about oral hypersensitivity and gagging. I see quite a lot of kids who have this problem. 
Um, and it's not related to the fact that they have Costello in particular or, or CFC. Um, I've got fit and healthy kids who have all issues um, and um, vomiting on demand, etc. Et it's all kind of centres around uh, avoidance more than anything. Um, so we do a lot of acclimatisation and desensitisation. Desensitisation is really a technique in itself and it's, it involves a hierarchy of, of stimuli. So you, you have, absolute, you have a, a, a spectrum, absolutely no effect whatsoever, right, right through to terrible, the worst it could ever be. Okay, and you can apply that to anything. You can apply it to pain, you can apply it to a fear of needles, for example, you can apply it to gagging. Okay, so in your in your spectrum, you might have completely fine, no gagging whatsoever. To just just the mere thought of it provokes gagging. Okay, so the way desensitisation works is you you've got that hierarchy. So you start at the the easy end, the lower end of the the, the spectrum, and you um, introduce a procedure that would normally provoke gagging, but you only do it until you're comfortable with that step and it, there's no gagging and then you move on to the next phase. And this can take months, it can take a long, long time, but it really works. And it's very similar to what Rebecca was talking about, about um, you know, a few couple of steps forward and one step back. So you only, only progress up that hierarchy um, when, you, when, you, when you are progressing. Okay? And you can't rush it, otherwise it doesn't work. Okay? So we use that quite successfully to um, desensitize kids who are prone to gagging particularly with mirrors in the mouth or um, toothbrushes even, that kind of thing. And we use it for needle phobia as well. Okay. Distraction really does work. It really does work. And I talked a little bit before about how to position yourself so that it's, it's, not, a big, it's not a big psychological barrier you're having to overcome by coming at the kid with a, with a toothbrush like a threat. Okay. It really does work. Um, toothbrushing in, at bath time works. Parents tell me this works. Okay. It might not be terribly effective but it's fun you know, and it, and it works and if your aim is you know, eventually that the child will be completely comfortable with, with a toothbrush whenever you present it, then do it. Do the fun stuff. Um, practice and practice and practice and practice and practice is the only thing that's going to work. Um, and lots of rewards and lots of bribery. I remember when I was a student we were told never bribe kids. They do it all the time but it works. It works. Um, Battery or electric toothbrushes? Yes, yes, definitely, definitely recommended. Um, I find that kids, uh, particularly kids with learning disabilities, or, or um, yeah, particularly kids with, with learning difficulties, it's the vibration that they find quite soothing. Kids with cerebral palsy are very tolerant of um, electric toothbrushes, and they are tremendous gaggers and bongers. So, um, I know that that works. So. <coughs> and the last, the last comment really is about professional follow-up. Make sure you have got a good dentist on your team because that's what, that's what your child will need to take them through their, their lifespan really. Okay. Um, you, there is absolutely no reason why your child can't go to the family dentist with you. Absolutely no reason. There is absolutely no reason why they can't also have a community dental team looking after them. And there's absolutely no reason why they can't also have a regional consultant who maybe sees them once a year when they're in the hospital. Okay. The more the merrier. Well, thank you very much. Well, I'm happy to take any more questions. Uh, you have a special toothbrush. Are they available anywhere or do you have to go to? Um, I think we get I think we order them from a particular supplier. I'm sure there's a website I can give you. Yeah, so the, over home we have one called Curly, but um, I'm just thinking it's only like two sides really, and I'm using a different one to go to the middle. Yeah. Um, and it's took a long time for her to get used to toothbrushes at all, but I'm wondering if that one would probably be better, but I can't get them either unless I go through a, a dentist person. Why okay. is that? Why Sorry. don't they just have something like that at, at the dentist? I don't know, because we just, we just buy them. I'm not, sure, I'm not quite sure where we get them from. There's, there's just a particular supply. We find them very useful, so we buy them in the... In the well, it's fine they're very useful with any child, really. Yeah. A lot better, especially yeah, younger sure. ones. Yeah. 
but they're not, it's just not available when you, when you want something like that, you can't get yeah. they, they tend to be more, I think maybe they tend to be more readily available in a community dental setting or a hospital setting because uh, the, those are the teams that are going to see kids with complex needs more often. Your average high street dentist may not have that many kids with medical problems on their books and may tend to sort of simply refer them to the community dentist or to the hospital dentist. So the focus is different there. Really. What you can do is warm face flannel, damp face flannel. Now we talked about not rinsing your toothbrush under the tap. But if your child can't spit, what you can do is just dampen the face flannel and then rub that around the teeth. That will take the excess off. If you're only using a little bit of toothpaste, the amount of foaming and bubbling from the toothpaste is going to be minimal anyway. It's going to be minimal. And a little bit of swollen toothpaste should be okay. It should be okay. Thank you very much. It's Outside, so should we have a 10 minute break and we'll come back?